Good morning, everyone. Shalom Aleichem, Tyra Forinder. Um, this is a great day for the Evo Institute, uh, for the Center for Jewish History, um, all of the partners in our building, because this is the first time we have brought uh, all of you together here. Let me tell you a couple things about this building, about the Center for Jewish History, about the partners, about YIVO, about our interest in this subject. The Center for Jewish History was established in the year 2000 for the purpose of bringing a variety of Jewish, uh, essentially archival institutions together, repositories, for the purpose of safeguarding the documentary history of the Jewish people in America, in Eastern Europe and Russia, uh, in, in uh, Germany, and so forth. The, the center consists of the Evo Institute for Jewish Research, which was founded in Vilna, Poland in 1925, the, the American Jewish Historical Society, which was founded in the late 19th century here in America, the Leo Beck Institute that was founded after the war in Germany, uh, the Yeshiva University Museum, which is an exhibition space devoted to Judaica and exhibiting partner organization materials, and the American Sephardi Federation, which is devoted to uh, the history of Sephardi Jewry. The Evo Institute, as many of you know, but not all of you, was founded <clears throat> when Vilna, now Vilnius, was Poland, not Lithuania. It was founded at a time of great optimism because of the signing of the Minorities Treaty in the wake of uh, World War I and Versailles, but at the same time, a period of intense anxiety. Many uh, particularly who were the founders of the Evo Institute were highly aware of the devastation that was wrought by the Russian Civil War, the pogroms of 1919-1920, which were simply a hundred years ago, in which hundreds of thousands of Jews were murdered across uh, the length and breadth of Eastern Europe. Uh, by the whites, by the black hundreds, by the Bolsheviks, by Ukrainian nationalists, by Cossacks, you name it. And so it was a time at which, in addition, there was also tremendous assimilation of Jewish, of the Jewish people into different national cultures, into Russian culture, Ukrainian culture, Romanian culture, uh, a Polish culture. And there was a feeling that our history and our traditions could get lost. This was not new. This was something that animated Shimon Dubnov, as well as Ansky, that led to the great Ansky expedition uh, of 1912, 1914, um, for the purpose of documenting as much of Jewish history uh, in the pale of settlement as was possible to do. A thousand years, essentially, of Jewish history in the pale of settlement. And so Ansky went throughout recording songs, getting folklore, uh, 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 collecting uh, objects, and so on and so forth. And the Evo Institute became the repository, one of the repositories of the Ansky expedition. And we have in this building the uh, records of, uh, of the Ansky expedition, including uh, original pages, uh, handwritten pages of the great play that he wrote, the Dibuk. But Evo is more than that. In this building and in our warehouse in Newark, we have some 23 million documents pertaining to the world of Jewish experience. <clears throat> Sholem Aleichem, Bergelson, Peretz, diaries, 
school records, um, the organizational records of, of uh, Grossinger's Country Club. Uh, we have jokes. We have what I have just discovered to be a uh, rather extensive and unique uh, archive of Yiddish pornography, <laughs> which we have not yet fully explored, but we are intending to do <laughs> with great enthusiasm. We have the uh, we have the archive of the Bund. We have uh, Shimon Dubnov's extraordinary collection of uh, rabbinical writings. We have material in Yiddish, in Hebrew, in Polish, in Russian, in French, in German. We have materials going back to the 16th century and we have materials that were collected during the World War II and the Holocaust in the ghettos. Some of you may have seen recently the Roberta Grossman movie based on Sam Kassow's book, Who Will Write Our History, which is about the uh, Ringelblum archive uh, in the Warsaw ghetto part of the Ringelblum archive is here at the YIVO Institute. When I went to Moscow not long ago, <clears throat> I was told that there was a new museum of Jewish history. And in that museum of Jewish history, one of the founders of it proudly told me they had 5,000 artifacts. <clears throat> when I said to him, Dr. Connor, this is marvelous, and I'm very delighted to know that. But you should know that Evo has 23 million documents, and he refused to believe me. He thought I was just an American liar. <laughs> and uh, it took him quite a while uh, of research, and finally he came to New York to have a look for himself. And he said, now I know you're telling the truth and I want to have uh, uh, a partnership with you so that these immense riches can become known to, uh, to my community in Russia. And so part of what we're doing <clears throat> now is in fact digitizing as much of this material as we possibly can and putting it on the internet. And I must tell you that one of, one of the impetuses for this conference today is that we discovered an enormous quantity of material that had never been seen before in Vilnius, Lithuania. Material that had been hidden during the Holocaust in a church. Uh, that is, it would, had been hidden and then after the Holocaust, when the Soviets wanted to destroy it, a second time it was hidden in a church and only came to light in 1991. But there was a subsection of that that even in 1991 remained unknown and that's what we recently discovered, 170,000 new documents. And among them was a poster. And on the poster was the word Antifa. And I was stunned. It seemed to me that that was very far away from our world, but it was not far away from our world. And I began to think about this more and more and more. And of course, I'm not a Yiddishist, but, but Soviet history and Soviet literature and Soviet Jewish culture is an area of great interest to me. And I'm well aware of the Dadaists and I'm well aware of Russian futurism. And I'm well aware of a huge subculture within Russian literature, Russian history that was Jewish and always seemed to me 
to be bordering on anarchy, anarchic principles, and anarchism in one way or another. And I began to wonder, why was this never talked about at Ebo? I don't have to believe in my nose to know that I have one and to accept that it's there. I don't need to be believe in the pineal gland to study it. I don't have to believe in anarchism to, to know that it is an integral part of my world. And yet, YIVO and the Center for Jewish History, and the more I thought about it, most of organized Jewish life did not want to talk about this, did not want to make itself available to understand itself, because I think that's what's at stake, which is how can we understand ourselves truly without understanding the whole of who we are? And so, in a way that perhaps Spencer Sunshine will describe in more detail when he speaks, uh, I managed to get in touch with Spencer. And I want to thank Spencer for his energy and his imagination and, and his contacts and his vision for what this could be. But it was through our conversations, and I think the most, the biggest thing I wanna thank Spencer for was his openness to have these conversations, because after all, what, what on earth would a stodgy institution like the YIVO Institute have to do with this cauldron of energy and life that I see in front of me right now? Everything, exactly. Thank you. Everything. We just have to demonstrate it. We just have to show it. And, and, and Spencer was open to that. Uh, and, and so I want to thank Spencer. I want to thank our wonderful group uh, at, at Evo, Alex and Ben and Jane and many others uh, who are here and who are wearing uh, tags and uh, for those of you who want to find out more about YIVO and want to find out more about our programs and so on and so forth, please do uh, get in touch with, with Ben or Alex or Jane. Please visit the, the booths outside where you can pick up information about YIVO, about our programs. Uh, think about signing up for our summer program. I see a couple people here from our summer program. Uh, where we teach Yiddish intensively. Uh, and I think they will tell you it's a great program. And um, we have tours and there are a whole variety of different activities and programs that I am delighted to be able to introduce to this group. So without more ado, I want to thank all of you for coming Again, I want to thank Spencer, I want to thank the organizers, and I want to thank all of the energy and imagination and creativity that is in this room now. Thank you very much. Wow. So originally I was gonna come and talk to you about why I had chosen to organize a conference about such an obscure and niche topic. At first I told Evo I thought maybe 70 people would show up and sit down for an all day conference. I mean like anarchists, they'll come to the you know parties, 30 or 40 people come to the benefits at Silent Barn, but like who's gonna sit through the whole thing? So it turned out over 1,300 people responded on Facebook as being interested or going. One person is apparently even coming from Croatia to come here. And so after this, I thought to myself, what have I done? 
a reporter who was writing about this conference. Okay, a reporter, does, reporters don't usually write about anarchist conferences. He said, why is there so much interest in Yiddish speaking anarchism? And so I told him, I have no idea. <laughs> okay, well, at least I do have some ideas. And I'll share my own idea with you, especially since I'm probably the only person here with this specific take, but this is why the conference happened. At a previous Evo class and talk on Jewish anarchists, the latter of which I had criticized from the audience, the Evo's head, Jonathan Brent, who just spoke, reached out to me, and he asked my thoughts on how a broader range of people could get involved in Evo. Okay, I'm a middle-aged white guy. If you're asking a middle-aged white guy about how more people like him can get involved, your organization may have a legacy problem. So Jonathan was particularly interested in having anarchists and radical Jews feel part of the YIVO community and to come to the programs here. Now, if you don't know this, most organizations are really interested in how to keep anarchists and radicals out of their spaces. <laughs> I'm a little more friendly than the other people in the anarchist scene. I frequently try to get mainstream groups to work with anarchists, and it's nearly impossible. I've even coined a word for this. It's the A word. Once you say it, people hang the phone up and run away. And now we have two word, A words, we have, anti, we have Antifa and Anarchist, so. So I was flabbergasted that Jonathan was interested in this. We met for lunch, the diner around the corner, and I brought him a stack of recently published books, many of which are for sale outside, about Yiddish-speaking anarchists, and some of which were based on research done here at the Yivo's Yid own archives. I explained there had been a renaissance in anarchist studies in the academy, and now there was an unprecedented number of anarchist professors. There were also a number of independent anarchists or independent intellectuals, including myself, who have doctorates, but we're running a muck in society rather than being safely locked up in the academy, which has an overcrowding problem, if you haven't heard. So um, uh, these have given today's anarchist and anti-fascist milieus a much more sophisticated and intellectual approach. And unsurprisingly, many of us are Jewish or from Jewish family backgrounds. So at lunch, at this lunch, I presented Jonathan with a list of 18 talks that I'd like to see at Evo, starting with an all-day, one-day, all-day anarchist conference on Yiddish-speaking anarchists. And to my shock, he accepted me the offer on the spot. We walked back to Evo, upstairs to the office. He introduced me to his staff, and then he told them they were going to help me organize this conference. <laughs> there, there was a, they gave me a look. Actually, there were two looks. The first one was, anarchists? And the second one was, who is this guy that Jonathan's dragged off the street? <laughs> I assured them I had done conferences before, and furthermore, there really were other people interested in this topic, and I do hope I have been true to my word. So people have come here to learn about the Yiddish-speaking anarchist for a variety of reasons, and I would guess that there are um, four most likely suspects. Um, actually, I don't know if you're not one of these four things, please come up to me afterwards and tell me, because I really do want to know why you're here. One, there's the historically minded who are curious about this part of Jewish history and New York history. Um, that has, as Jonathan said, until recently been almost completely ignored. One of the few things that Marxists and liberal academics can agree on is both of them wish that anarchists had never existed, either in the past or in the present. And boy, can I tell you some, I went to the Graduate Center, boy, can I tell you some stories about Marxist professors having talks and talking about like historical figures and they mention all the figures and their politics and everything. When it comes to the anarchists, they just say their names and keep going. <laughs> Anarchist. Um, <laughs> second, the, Yiddish, the Yiddishist crowd um, may be the ones most likely to already know about this tradition since they can read the existing materials. I mean, the old uh, papers, the Fire Arbiter Stone stuff are available at, La um, you know, Labadee or Tamman or the other archives, and they're probably looking to learn more about a movement that they might already know something about from primary sources. Three, radical Jews who reject Zionism um, are probably interested in Yiddish anarchism because they're looking at a variety of historical alternatives which they can ransack for materials in their quest to build a new, positive, radical Jewish identity. And this, I think, goes hand in hand with the revival of Bundism, which I'm also interested in, and the Bund's archives are here, and there's been several um, very good presentations and classes about Bundist history here. Of course, people who are specifically anarchists, including I'm sure many people in this room, are interested in looking at the Yiddish anarchist current as they try and figure out what a specifically anarchist Jewish identity might look like today. And I would guess that some of this is fueled by an exhaustion with the role of the anti-Zionist Jew, which unfortunately is the only Jewish identity that's on offer in the radical left today. 
And while there's nothing wrong with this, it's a purely negative thing, which is nothing positive to say about Jewish identity or tradition. And people, even who are firm anti-Zionist, I think want to have a more affirmative role about their Jewish identity. Four, lots of anarchists, including many who are not from Jewish backgrounds, are interested in the largely forgotten history of their own political tradition. As this conference will discuss, the left-wing anarchist movement in the United States was originally a pretty much an immigrant affair. The early US anarchists were divided into different language groups, uh, into different groups, but they were divided by language and not by ethnicity. And so in the US, there were Russian, German, Spanish, Yiddish, Italian, Chinese, French, Japanese, and other anarchist speaking scenes. And each group then had their own newspapers, they had their, their own uh, groups and their own meeting places sometimes. And so this is why this is a conference today about Yiddish speaking anarchists and not about Jewish anarchists. Some of the people we'll be speaking about weren't Jewish at all, including famously Rudolf Ronker. Um, and we would put together quite a different conference if it had been about Jewish anarchism. So if you look at today's New York, I don't know who lives in New York or is active in the, um, in the anarchist milieu here. In the anarchist punk scene today, the, it's, the, it looks like this today. It's divided into two scenes, an Anglophone scene and the Latino punk scene that's Spanish speaking. Uh, the latter is a largely immigrant milieu and the barrier to participating in it is largely linguistic. It's not about your ethnicity. I mean, anyone can go to the shows, but that's how the divide goes down. And I think it's very similar to the divides in the past. So I have, however, of those four things, my own specific interest in Yiddish speaking anarchism. And here's where either half is going to go over half the heads of half the people and half of you are going to love this and the other half are going to boo me. So I'm agnostic about anarchism itself. Um, I, in particular, I'm not swayed by anarchism's best known feature, which is the wholesale rejection of the state. Although I do agree the state cannot be the mechanism of a revolutionary transformation. I do strongly believe that a libertarian socialist approach has important things to offer the world. And I believe that any serious form of libertarian socialism, which is one to the left of social democracy and two is not a dialect of Marxism, will have to engage with anarchism as its starting point, no matter where it ends up. Um, and that's because anarchism has always been the main libertarian socialist current in my mind. So as the Yiddish speaking anarchist Rudolf Rocker said, anarchism is a combination of the best of socialism and liberalism. And this is necessary because as Mikhail Bakunin, the founding theoretician of classical anarchism and also a vicious anti-Semite, I know, said freedom without socialism is privilege and injustice and socialism without freedom is slavery and brutality. And what he said was true in the 1800s, and it's true today. So I wrote my dissertation up at the CUNY Graduate Center um, about anarchist theory in the United States after 1960, and I focused what were the theoretical implications on the shift between classical and contemporary anarchism. And if you've never suffered through graduate school, let me assure you, you are not supposed to do this. If you want to write about something radical, you should make sure it is long dead and buried. If you have tenure, you can do it, and they still don't like it when you do. The classical anarchist tradition is roughly 100 years spanning from 1840 when Proudhon published What is Property until 1939 when the uh, Spanish Republic finally fell and the anarchists were defeated militarily by Franco. And it is true that classical anarchist theory is no blend of German philosophy, English political economy, and French socialism, as one Russian radical said. But counter to the last person who spoke here, Evo, on anarchism, Classical anarchism does have a far more sophisticated and coherent set of theoretical beliefs than most people realize. And it has the great advantage of consistently refusing to value either freedom or justice over the other. So um, most people who are interested in mining this body of thought, and maybe I'm showing my age here, this was maybe more of a discussion in the 90s and 0s, um, agree, who like classical anarchist theories, agree they need to be updated. Uh, but there is no agreement about how this updating should be done. Now, if you've ever spent time around anarchists, this isn't going to come as any surprise. If people here think that uh, two Jews, three opinions is too much, come to the Anarchist Book Fair in New York sometime. <laughs> Just, I mean, I run security for the book fair usually, and I got to say it's a pain every, every year. We don't run security for the anarchist infightings just for the fascist, um, who do show up. And so, but overall, neither anarchist activists nor academics nor people who are both have engaged in some kind of reassessment and revision of classical anarchist beliefs. What's happened instead is contemporary anarchists um, have kept a loose adherence to the political conclusions set up by the classical anarchists. I'm going to exclude, I was thinking of this after I wrote this, I'm going to exclude syndicalists from this because they have a bit of a different track. But so this is about the rest of anarchists. However, so they keep this loose framework when it comes to specific questions, and these are particularly 
Um, it's particularly uh, clear on questions of identity, nationalism, imperialism, colonialism, and anti-Zionism. Anarchists have simply inserted critiques that they've taken from other theoretical traditions with little or no revision into their thought. And this is true even when these ideas directly conflict with core anarchist positions on the state of nationalism, on means ends congruency, and about being against all forms of, of oppression, and in particular when this involves anti-Semitism. This is so bad, I invented my own slogan for this. It's called Against All Oppression, Some Exceptions Apply. We'll be fair, I, and I know some people are here on the anarchist academics list who've been through this, these fights with me and everyone else, and it's probably like, oh, I've heard Spencer say this already. So. Um, to be fair, anarchists are no worse than any, part, uh, any other part of the left about this, and they are better than some others. I mean, there's, it's not a place where the real stinkers are. Um, but in general, I can say the left is, uh, people are gonna say to you this in an anarchist space or left space, but this is a Jewish space. The left is awful on this issue, and it pains me to sit down with Evo volunteers and tell them I'm a radical leftist, and they go, oh, the left is anti-Semitic. I mean, somebody did something to earn that reputation. So left anti-Semitism is nowhere as near bad as the right portrays it, but it is a consistent and almost entirely unaddressed problem. This is one of my other pet, pet areas of interest. So back to anarchist theory. The problem with incorporating hot takes from other political traditions into an anarchist framework is they're usually based in firmly authoritarian ontologies and epistemologies, and this is particularly true on questions of identity and imperialism. So in my reading, the difference between post-1960 US anarchism and that of the classical era is this, that classical anarchists were consistent in trying to figure out their political positions by looking through a libertarian socialist onto epistemological lens and were committed to doing this. They would not accept views that did not fall within that. Today, anarchists seem to borrow doctrines that Marxist-Leninists, revolutionary nationalists, and post-structuralists have left lying around and are now just up for grabs. This ends up with anarchists espousing things like an inverted hierarchy that advocates the leadership of certain categories of people who have suffered oppression, or a revanchist nationalism based on blood and soil doctrines, or a simplistic politics which divides the world between oppressed and oppressor nations, both internally and externally. No one's thrown anything yet, okay. So to me, when anarchists, as well as all libertarian socialists in general, ask the question, how should a specific issue be approached? Our first instinct should be to ask how have anarchists and other libertarian socialists approached this question in the past? Because they are the ones who insisted that their formulations be kept within an internally consistent existing framework that had a dual commitment to freedom and justice. So we're coming back to the conference. We cannot incorporate this history if we do not know what they thought. And we cannot know what they thought if A, we don't read the languages that they wrote in, because I'm a monolingual English speaker like many native born white Americans. Um, and B, there is no English language secondary scholarship about these beliefs. And that brings us back here. What did Yiddish speaking anarchists think about racial and ethnic identity, nationalism, Zionism, and imperialism? I'm pretty sure the scholars who've come here today will provide us, including myself, with some of these answers. So I've helped organize, organize the conference for this reason, because I see it as an attempt to um, rescue anarchist history, which can revitalize anarchist theory, which might in turn contribute to a larger, workable, and ontologically and epistemologically consistent libertarian socialist theory and politic. I am deeply pessimistic in general. As I get older, I really think Sartre is right. Hell is other people. And it may, in fact, be hell may be other anarchists. But I also think a libertarian socialist approach I've outlined has a real potential as a kind of combination of doikite and tikkun alum, because here, where we live, things are deeply broken and they're really in need of repair. So I have three unconnected things to end with. The first is this is a rare conference in a mainstream institution where anarchists are not gonna be treated like either bugs or antiques. We will not be the object of hostile, of, we will not be the object of analysis by hostile criminologists or unsympathetic Marxists. Once in a while you do get a sympathetic Marxist like Heather Gottney, but rare, rare is the person. Uh, Kenyon, Zimmer, and I, the conference co-organizer, have done our best to make sure this conference is going to be the good shit, real high-quality anarchist scholarship. And I'm going to tell you, there is sometimes a dearth of this, and this ain't going to be what this is. This conference is also happening in dialogue with New York City's anarchist community. On that note, I would like to invite everybody to the after party at the East River Bar. It is at 97 South 6th Street in South Williamsburg, near the Marcy JMZ. The after party is an unofficial event, not connected to YIVO. 
but it is sponsored by MAC, the Metropolitan Anarchist Coordinating Council, the New York IWW, the New York City Anarchist Book Fair, and MUJU, the Muslim Jewish Anti-Fascist Front, and I, other conference speakers, and hopefully you will join us there. Also $4 paps. Second, Yiddish speaking anarchists did not only live in the remote past, and those who've been directly influenced by them are probably younger than you might think. So I'm gonna give you uh, four examples of people that I personally or my friends knew. Um, some people here I'm guessing may have known Clara and Sidney Solomon, who mentored many Long Island teenage anarchists in the 1990s, a number of whom now are in their 40s and are active um, writers and activists in the milieu. Audrey Goodfriend, who I believe died in 2003, was close to many of the Oakland post-left anarchists and insurrectionists, including the staff of AJODA, Anarchy, a Journal of Desire Armed. If you looked at the, watched the magazine in the O's in early teens and there was an old woman who was a t-shirt model, that was Audrey. Um, and she, actually way back in the day, had been in a group with Sam Dolgoff. So of course, Esther and Sam Dolgoff were close to many anarchists in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, uh, some of whom I'm sure are also here today and their son, Anatoly Dolgoff, will speak more about his influential parents in the co conference's keynote speech. Second, if you're interested in Yiddish or the secular Jewish community, I encourage you to participate in it. Just like with anarchism, it is a participatory practice. I volunteer here at the Center for Jewish History, and which is partly how this all came about, and I would like to invite others also to get involved in the city's vibrant secular Jewish community. And I specifically want to extend this invitation to two kinds of people. One, I know many of you out there have some Jewish family background. It's your dad, or you grew up in a totally secular family. Um, but this has never been a major part of your identity, and you probably have little contact with the organized Jewish community. If you would like to have more, the door is open. Um, they don't bite, and this is one of the fabulous places that you can get involved in. I especially also want to extend this invitation to people who have no Jewish family background. Um, I would like to point out, point out that several of the conference participants, including my co-organizer and Yiddish speaker, Kenyon Zimmer, are not from Jewish backgrounds. And to me, this is really heartening. Because the well, way I look at it, the world is obsessed with Jews. Jews, anti-Semitism, Israel, it's constantly on the front page of every newspaper. It's constantly talked about far and way beyond any actual numbers, influence, or real world, 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 real world doings. But despite this, the vast majority of people have no interest in learning anything about Jewish history, about the many Jewish languages, because there's not just Yiddish and Hebrew, there's Ladino, there's Judeo-Arabic, or really anything else about really existing Jews or Jewish history or the Jewish community. They talk about Jews all the time and they don't wanna know anything real. So I ask you to please help change that. I can't speak for anyone, but from my perspective, the litmus test for participating in New York City's secular Jewish community is neither ethnic nor religious. It is simply, are you interested in learning more about Jewish life and participating in it? And I'll point out, all of you by sitting here are already doing this. So last, I want to, the, the, the uh, obligatory thanks, I want to thank Kenyon Zimmer, Zimmer, who graciously agreed to co-organize this conference with me and did a fabulous job. I would like to thank all the speakers who will be introduced separately. I'd like to thank Christine Kiritnitsky and Eric Larson, whose objections to the previous YIVO presentation set the wheels in motion for this. I'd like to thank Sharona, Julie, and Christine for moderating, Sharona and Moisha for the after party, and everybody else who stepped up to volunteer. I'd like to thank Claire Ehrlich, who did last week's Jewish Currents interview with three scholars of Jewish anarchism, Tony Michaels, who was originally scheduled to speak, and on behalf of YIVO and the conference organizers, I send best wishes and healing thoughts to his family. I'd like to thank the two designers who did great work for us, Dan Sideradsky and Chris, who did the after party logo. Dan did the wonderful conference logo with the flag. Um, I'd like to thank the Evo staff, including Alex, Jessica, Jen, Bain, Ben, Eddie, and Eddie for Center for Jewish History, and special thanks to Jonathan Brent and Alex Weiser, without whom there would be no conference. So finally, I want to thank everyone here today for sharing with me what I thought was, until now, a very obscure interest in mine. It makes me happy that it turns out that the pre-war Yiddish-speaking anarchists are not so forgotten after all. So thank you all, and I hope we have a great conference. Uh, before, before we go any farther uh, and um, uh, uh, before Kenyon will speak, I do want to, I forgot to make one announcement, which is I, uh, 
ask all of you to please see the ex exhibit on the subject of immigration that is just right around the corner from the Great Hall uh, that uh, Eddie Portnoy uh, 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 put up for YIVO. It is extraordinary. It will blow you away, frankly, when you see these graphics. Uh, and I also want uh, to direct your attention to the exhibit of materials from the YIVO archive and library in the vitrine out in the Great Hall that I think is, is just a very small taste of the materials that we have. Uh, there is also a list, and Ben, I'm not sure where that list is, of materials from, uh, it's outside on, on the tables, of materials for further study on the subject of the history of anarchism that you will find in our library and archive. Thank you very much. Any questions? I'd like to invite the panel up. Good morning. Uh, I'm Christine Karadnitsky. <laughs> um, just a few sort of housekeeping notes before we start. Uh, this is the first panel. Uh, it uh, will go, our lunch break is at 12.30. Uh, we hope to end a little bit before that. Uh, the way the panels are arranged. Uh, each speaker will have not more than 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes. I will introduce them each individually uh, for their presentations and we'll have questions uh, after everyone is finished. Uh, 20 minutes is the firm ending, so I ask you to be mindful of that and I can actually be helpful in reminding you. Um, okay. Kenyon Zimmer will start us off with The Lost World of Yiddish Anarchism, an introduction. Kenyon is an associate professor of history at the University of Texas Arlington and is the co-organizer of the Yiddish Anarchism Conference, as we've heard. He's the author of Immigrants Against the State, Yiddish and Italian Anarchism in America, and numerous articles on the history of anarchism. He's currently working on a book about the deportees of America's first Red Scare. All right, thank you everyone for showing up for this fantastic event. Thank you to Yivo, thank you to Spencer Sunshine for uh, kindly making an offer I couldn't refuse to uh, help co-organize this conference. Um, so my role here is to sort of introduce in, in relatively broad strokes some of the history um, that many of the subsequent speakers will go into in more detail. Um, so why, uh, is the conference refer to Yiddish anarchism as a forgotten tradition? Um, because although many people are vaguely aware that it existed maybe in the 1890s, um, there's not a whole lot more that's remembered other than a few figures like Emma Goldman. So I wanna start right here in Manhattan uh, with the Manhattan Bridge because the chief engineer on the Manhattan Bridge was a Latvian Jewish immigrant named Leon Moiseev, who, uh, if you Google his name, you'll find a couple of short biographical things, uh, for instance, on the PBS website of, uh, about the Golden Gate Bridge, because he was one of the consulting engineers on the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and it'll tell you things like he was an, uh, a native of Latvia who immigrated to the United States in 1891. And then, as the PBS website puts it, uh, he was so happy about living in America that he named his daughter Liberty. So, that's an inference by whoever wrote this 
that is um, not entirely correct because Leon Moiseev was, he became an anarchist shortly after moving to the Lower East Side of New York where he first encountered anarchism. Uh, like most Yiddish speaking anarchists, he was not an anarchist when he arrived, uh, although he had some radical sympathies beforehand. Uh, in fact, he named his first daughter Liberty because he was an anarchist. He, and he edited the Yiddish language anarchist journal, Die Freie Gesellschaft, The Free Society. That was the liberty he was thinking of, was that of a libertarian socialist society, not what he found in the United States. But that's been erased, literally erased. His Wikipedia page similarly makes not one single mention of his politics, which he held throughout his life. Uh, and if you walk across the, the Manhattan Bridge, you'll, you'll find his name on, on a plaque or two on there, of course, with no mention of his political affiliation. Similarly, in uh, 2016, Verso Books published a book called Revolutionary Yiddishland, A History of Jewish Radicalism, which contains not one single mention of a single Jewish anarchist. Uh, which prompted the anarchist collective Crime Think to write a review uh, in the form of a satirical letter to the publisher asking for a refund for the defective book that they had <laughs> received. So what exactly is it that's been erased? Uh, what's been erased is a one-time thriving, vibrant, and quite influential segment of both the American left and the American Jewish community. Uh, this was a movement that you could find coverage on in Harper's Weekly, for example. That was once in the public spotlight, and even more so in the Yiddish public spotlight. This was a movement that lasted from the 1880s, when the, the very first Jewish anarchist group in the world was formed in the Lower East Side in 1887, in response to the ongoing Haymarket trial, where, uh, that eventually resulted in the Haymarket anarchists being hanged and lasted, uh, persisted with some members of that first generation of Yiddish-speaking immigrant Jews uh, into the 1970s and beyond, even uh, into the, the 80s, as some of those, um, as Spencer mentioned, and they became mentors to subsequent generations. And Yiddish-speaking anarchists played crucial roles in Yiddish life, Yiddish language, and Yiddish culture in the United States and the world. People like David Edelstadt, the Yiddish sweatshop poet, uh, Joseph Bov Bovshever, who we're going to hear more about, um, the sort of founders of modern Yiddish poetry were dedicated anarchists, or Alexander Harkavi, the uh, famous Yiddish lexographer whose uh, Yiddish-English-Hebrew dictionary is still in print and in use today, most people don't know, was himself an anarchist. He wrote for and contributed to anar Yiddish anarchist newspapers. So, they played a role in literally helping build Yiddish language and culture in the United States and elsewhere. Uh, and there's more poets, playwrights, cultural critics, and translators. Yiddish-speaking Jews were prolific translators of great works of literature and science and philosophy from other languages. They were also prolific publishers and writers uh, of newspapers. The very first Yiddish newspaper uh, Yiddish anarchist newspaper in the world was published in New York City, Varheit, founded in 1889, uh, a paper on which David Edelstadt, among others, worked. Uh, this first generation of Jewish, of Yiddish speaking Jewish anarchists on the Lower East Side and places like Philadelphia was profoundly influenced, as we're going to hear from Tom Goyens, um, by their German anarchist neighbors, as the two languages are linked and somewhat mutually intelligible. Uh, but by far the most important Yiddish anarchist newspaper in both the United States and the world was the Freier Arbeiterstimme, the Free Voice of Labor, uh, which persisted with brief interruptions from 1889 to 1977. The Freier Arbeiterstimme was both the largest circulating and longest lasting anarchist newspaper in American history. And yet, only about half a dozen scholars have ever read it. Its readership extended across the globe, but was particularly concentrated, of course, in the United States and places like New York. Uh, 
these are the circulation figures for the Freie Arbeit Stimme, which peaked at about 30,000 copies per issue in 1914, which various estimates place at a readership of 100, 150,000 or so. Just to put this into perspective, um, as late as 1904, 1905, 1906, uh, the Yiddish Daily Forward only had a circulation about three times that of the Freie Arbeit Stimme. The longtime editor of the Freie Arbeit Stimme was the anarchist Saul Janowski, uh, who was profoundly important not only as a commentator on anarchist ideas, on the Jewish labor movement, but also on Yiddish literature and poetry. He was renowned for discovering new Yiddish poetic talent and first publishing it in the anarchist Freie Arbeit Stimme. As one uh, of his late contemporaries put it, for a few continuous decades, he was the spiritual trailblazer for innumerable Jewish journalists, writers, actors, trade union organizers, and community leaders in Jewish society, and hence in the social life of millions of immigrant Jews in their new home. Yet, while I imagine everyone in this room has heard of um, Gahan, of the Jewish Daily Forward, um, the name of Yanovsky will be new to probably at least some of you. Over time, uh, the Yiddish anarchists developed a particular shared understanding of Jewish identity and Jewishness, or Yiddishkeit. This was defined by Yiddish language, was one of the defining characteristics, which of course, that's a whole, excludes Sephardic and, and other Jewish groups, absolutely, um, was based in, in secular Yiddish culture and uh, in a common enemy in anti-Semitism. In fact, one early Yiddish anarchist statement um, on Jew Jewishness stated that it was anti-Semitism in particular that bound Jews together as a group. Um, what it was not defined by, importantly, was any sort of territorial homeland. This was a very explicitly non-Zionist, um, non-territorialist uh, definition of Jewishness. It was largely uh, a definition that rejected Judaism as part as an essential core of Jewish identity, but there's an asterisk there because there were some important exceptions, uh, some of which we'll hear about later um, in later panels with individuals like Abba Gordon, who very much tried to link uh, Jewish uh, religious tradition to anarchism. And it also did not define Jewishness by biology or descent. This was a flexible, cultural, and linguistic definition of what it meant to be a Jew or at least a Yiddish uh, anarchist. It was flexible enough to include people who had no Jewish ancestry. People like Rudolf Rocker, who was a German Gentile, who we'll hear more about uh, from Ben Gidley uh, on a later panel, who after moving to London and encountering Yiddish speaking Jew uh, anarchists there, uh, taught himself Yiddish and went on to become editor of the Arbeiter Freund, an important Yiddish anarchist newspaper there. Eventually, uh, he. Uh, was deported to Germany during World War I and then fled Nazism to the United States in 1933 and remained a towering figure in Yiddish anarchist circles, referred to by many as an anarchist rabbi, but a very peculiar rabbi with no actual uh, Jewish ancestry. Also, the native-born American anarchist Voltaire de Clare, who was a major figure in Philadelphia's anarchist movement and was very close to the Yiddish-speaking anarchist movement there. She taught Jewish anarchists uh, like Joseph J. Cohen, who was a successor of Yanovsky at the Freie Arbeit Stimme, taught them English and they taught her Yiddish. She learned to write Yiddish. We have handwritten Yiddish letters and articles of her here uh, held in YIVO um, in uh, a, a collection that's a shared collection with her and Joseph J. Cohen, whose great granddaughter is with us today. Um, and she wrote original Yiddish language articles for the Freie Arbeiter Stimme. So you could be a Yiddish anarchist without being actually a Jewish anarchist, in other words. Wilderin de Clare also belonged to the Philadelphia anarchist branch of the Workmen's Circle, the Jewish Socialist Fraternal Organization, which actually had more than a dozen explicitly anarchist branches, um, some of which, like the Radical Library Group in Philadelphia, included non-Jewish members, which was unusual. Of course, the most famous Jewish anarchist in American history is Emma Goldman. If you've ever heard of one single Jewish anarchist, it's Emma Goldman. Um, 
who had a long storied, well covered career that uh, led to her being arrested at least 16 times on various charges that I don't have time to enumerate, but they're there on the screen. Um, and which eventually resulted in her deportation in 1919. Uh, Although even that did not cease her activity, she of course went on to become a very uh, early and influential cr uh, left-wing critic of, the, of Soviet communism. Um, now one of the peculiar things about Emma Goldman, who's often pointed to as a sort of quintessential Jewish anarchist, is although she was multilingual, she spoke uh, Yiddish, German, Russian, uh, and English, she didn't feel comfortable speaking in Yiddish. So although she delivered lectures in Yiddish, she preferred other languages, and increasingly over time preferred to focus on English language um, propaganda to try to reach English-speaking American workers. So she was actually really sort of on the margins of the Yiddish anarchist movement, so to speak. Um, there are many other Yiddish-speaking anarchist women who have been largely forgotten by history. Women like Katharina Yevzorov, uh, who was a remarkable, uh, educated uh, Russian Jewish woman. She earned her medical degree at NYU in 1893. She was uh, an official of, of, in the workmen's circle. Uh, she wrote on uh, women's issues on, on uh, so for, for, for example, she wrote a, a, a book, Die Freude in der Gesellschaft, The Women and Society, which used anthropological evidence to argue, um, uh, essentially at, to argue for uh, in favor of a critique of patriarchy. She, um, I've learned from, that, from Dr. Uh, Anna Elena Torres, is rumored to be the inspiration for the original short story, Yentl, by Singer. Um, she also uh, was intriguingly, although an anarchist, a proponent of women's suffrage, involved in the suffragist movement. And she also helped her husband, the prolific anarchist writer and translator, Jacob Marison, produce the first and only Yiddish translation of Marx's Das Kapital. But you'll find many women, many of whom whose names have been forgotten uh, and lost to history in the rank and file of the Jewish anarchist movement. The Jewish anarchist movement in the United States had by far the uh, greatest gender representation of, of women of any ethnic or linguistic segment of the movement. And that has to do partially with the demographics of Jewish immigration, but also to uh, a real commitment um, on, on many uh, participants' part to women's equality. Um, so here, for instance, we have a, a group of Jewish anarchists in Chicago, and in the front, uh, you, we have two organizers, um, Aaron Barron and his wife, Fania Barron, who were organizer, organizers for both the Industrial Workers of the World and also an organization called the Union of Russian Workers, which we're going to learn more about uh, later today. They were involved in the International Ladies' Garment Workers' Union. You would find them on the front lines of the Great Uprising of uh, 1909. Um, in the 1910, or sorry, the uprising of the 20,000 th 20, in 1909, the Great Uprising in 1910. In fact, the head of the picket committee for the 1910 uh, garment worker strike was the anarchist Moore Sigmund, who uh, ended up having to fight a false murder charge along with some other organizers as a result of that. The Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire of 1911 one of the survivors of that fire who was just exiting the building when the fire broke out and who witnessed more than 140 of her coworkers plummet, plummet or burn to death was the anarchist Mary Abrams, who was part of a four person bargaining committee, informal bargaining committee within uh, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. She eventually was de deported from the United States with her husband, Jacob Abrams, during the first Red Scare. Uh, that they ended up living in Mexico City in exile after leaving the Soviet Union, where uh, according to one story, uh, Jack Abrams used to play chess with Trotsky and they would argue about Stalin and Kronstadt. Moore Zygmunt went on to become president of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union from 1923 to 1928. So for most of the 1920s, the president of one of the most important unions in the country was a Yiddish-speaking Jewish anarchist. Although in a lot of historical works, you'll find him referred to as a right-wing socialist somehow. <laughs> He's also the only anarchist to have a liberty ship named after him during World War II. A very peculiar honor. Uh, Rose Posada is one of the most 
famous anarchist members of the LGWU. She was an organizer, eventual vice president of that union. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about the persistence of Jewish anarchism, even in the face of the enormity of the Second World War and the Holocaust. Um, so after the Second World War, the LGWU sent Rose Posada and some others as part of a group to go to post-war Europe to visit devastated Jewish communities and figure out the best way that the union and its membership could aid those communities. So Posada, among other places, visited what remained of the Jewish ghetto in Łódź, Poland, or Lodz. And she uh, wrote in an unpublished account that as they were visiting places, she encountered a man who had under his arm a copy of the Friar Arbiterstimme. Turned out he was a friend of a friend. He, he asked how the union could help them. He was involved in a Jewish underwear-making cooperative that they had started up. And he introduced her to the other surviving members of his anarchist group. And this is what she wrote. Curiously enough, none of them asked for help for themselves or for visas, but all they wanted was moral support, literature, a printing press, and a linotype machine in Polish. Not Yiddish, Polish. Also, new material as well as old books and pamphlets by Kropotkin, Rudolf Rocker, Carlo Bernieri, and others to be reprinted in Polish. So in other words, in the aftermath of the Holocaust in Poland, the survivors of the Jewish ghetto there wanted nothing more than to reach out to their Polish-speaking neighbors with the message of libertarian socialism and mutual aid. And I can't think of a more profound illustration of the commitment to these ideals than that. So in short, this is a remarkable history that's been largely forgotten, made up of people who, um, as is summed up in the epitaph on Saul Yanovsky's grave over in Mount Car Carmel Cemetery, were ard ardently and unselfishly devoted toward establishing human society on principles of no coercion and no exploitation. And I think for that alone, they deserve our recognition and remembrance to say nothing of their actual major contributions to Jewish culture and the Jewish labor movement that I've very briefly run through here. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny. Um, Tom Goyans will speak next on Radical Neighbors, New York's German and Yiddish Anarchists, 1880-1906. Uh, Tom is an associate professor of history at Salisbury University in Maryland. His research focuses on immigrant anarchism in the United States. He's the author of, this is good, Beer and Revolution, the German Anarchist Movement in New York City, 1880-1914. Uh, editor of Helene Minken's memoir, Storm in My Heart, Memories from the Widow of Johann Most, and editor of Radical Gotham, Anarchism in New York City from Schwab's Saloon to Occupy Wall Street. His articles have appeared in Social Anarchism, Rethinking History, the Journal of Theory and Practice, and the Journal for the Study of Radicalism. He's currently writing a new biography of Johann Most. Um, all right, thank you for coming. Um, um, I'm honored to be here. So I, um, my, uh, my paper is, um, I'm gonna just give some aspects of this symbiotic relationship between the German and Yiddish anarchists. Um, there, there's a lot to say here, uh, and I can certainly elaborate a little more later. Um, 
I, um, I basically argue that, broadly speaking, the single most important legacy of the German anarchist movement in New York was to lay the groundwork for the Yiddish one. And the Yiddish anarchist movement then sort of transmits anarchism into the 20th century, I think. And that, that's sort of really broad lines here. Um, I, uh, I we, we have heard a little bit um, of this. Okay, that's that's supposed to be Manhattan and the Lower East Side, um, but you can, I don't know if you could sort of make out here the East River there, but um, we've heard a little bit. So a, a Yiddish anarchism emerges in, in in New York City in like the 1880s. Um, it's in the little Germany section um, of Lower Manhattan, Klein Deutschland. Uh, and Yiddish was adopted by that movement as uh, I think they go through sort of there's a Russian uh, intellectuals and in, almost via German adopt sort of the Yiddish language of the rank and file. Um, and it's, so I, with this slide, I've, I, it doesn't come out very well, but the, so the if you could see the black, the black dots and the red dots, and does that, is, so the black dots are the German, uh, this is selective, the German meeting places that I've, so this is a map I've, I've used in, in my first book, and I've sort of mapped on some of the uh, Yiddish meeting places that are sort of in the lower, lower east side. Um, and so I, I think, uh, I think Kenyon Zimmer in his book has called it sort of a geographic and linguistic proximity of the two movements. Okay, so I think um, the affinity between the German and Yiddish uh, um, anarchists is best embodied in the person of Johann Most. I, I don't have time to do a broad biography here, uh, but he was a German atheist, firebrand, anarchist speaker who arrives in New York City in December 1882, uh, he had just finished a 16-month prison uh, sentence because he had publicly celebrated the assassination of the Tsar. Um, and, and, and so this, this caused, um, in, including in Russia, caused many Russian Jews and revolutionaries to immigrate to the United States. So Moss comes a bit, sort of a bit later in 18, uh, late 1882. Um, so one, one thing that's particularly important here is Moss's fiery oratory. Um, there, we have lots of commentary on this that, that seem to have really sort of mesmerized, not just Yiddish-speaking anarchists, but many. Um, and so I have a few sort of eyewitnesses. There, there are a number of them. Uh, Coppola, for example, uh, called Moss the giant of the revolution. And he remembered, quote, the audience was as if in a hypnotic spell. Uh, Chaim Weinberg of, of Philadelphia recalled that Moss, quote, all but bewitched every listener, opponent, as well as friend. And Julius Seltzer stated that, quote, Moss, more than anyone else, made an anarchist out of me. Uh, it's it's maybe, you know, it's very important to stress how important oratory was um, in, in these movements. Um, Most also employed um, a young Jewish um, activist named Alexander Berkman, who some of you know, in his Freiheit office. So Most published, had been publishing this German language anarchist, socialist first, but then anarchist newspaper. Okay, sticking with Johann Moss for, for a minute, there were many, well, not many, but there were a few sort of intimate connections between Most and Jewish activists. Um, one, uh, Kenyon mentioned uh, Emma Goldman, uh, and there, there is, there's more to this than that I perhaps have time for now, but they later on have a falling out over a number of issues, in term, including gender, political violence as, as a tactic. Um, I, I do want to mention one thing that's sort of relevant here, I think, that um, 
when this sort of blows up um, at a meeting of the pioneers of liberty. This was one of the first uh, Yiddish anarchist groups in, in New York. At one of those meetings, uh, uh, Goldman horsewhipped Most in public on the stage. We have a few accounts of this. <laughs> this made a sensation. Um, and I've always sort of wondered what was the, what was sort of the, the fallout in, internally in the, in the movement about it. So in the wake of this, this was in 1892, the Pioneers of Liberty basically condemned Goldman, as they called it, wickedness, this, this behavior. Um, um, in return, uh, Goldman publishes a small, uh, what is that called, rebuttal, I guess, um, in, in another German anarchist newspaper, not Freiheit. There was, there was a rival of Freiheit. Um, and she, in which she claimed that most, yeah, he always had the, the quote as the greatest contempt for Jewish anarchists. Um, and so that's sort of intriguing. I think it's a little bit over, over the top um, because there were so many uh, close relationships between Most and the Jewish anarchists. He, after that, he, he does regular lecture series on topics of history in many of these Yiddish anarchist groups. Um, uh, then, so the other person here in the middle is Helena Minkin, who was a roommate of Goldman and, and Berkman, I believe, too, at a, at a, at a moment. Um, she was also an anarchist, but she and Most really became a couple. She was a common law wife and becomes the mother of their two children. And unlike uh, the previous anarchist who named uh, a child Most and <laughs> and Minkin named their children John Jr. and Lucifer. So, um, I, John Jr. Uh, is, is, I think he, he, become, he grows up, becomes a dentist, I think he's involved in NAACP. Um, but, um, so I've, I've been in touch with uh, um, a grandchild of them, um, I have that right, and he emailed me that they that he still has these little, um, uh, what is that called? These little pins, which is the the, the photograph of Mo, of Johann Most on it. He still has it. So um, I use the same. Oops, this is all a little washed out. I'm sorry. Um, so this uh, Kenyon has used this is often uh, used at the Harper's Weekly, I believe. Uh, so. Yiddish anarchists didn't just attend uh, uh, lectures. They also organized their own groups and their own language. Um, I think one of the impetuses is Haymarket. Uh, they learned from their German comrades about the International Working People's Association, the IWPA, which was this anarchist, American anarchist federation set up in Pittsburgh in 1883. Uh, the Pittsburgh Manifesto, which was basically a distillation of Most's ideas, was uh, by many groups adopted. Uh, just a few quotes. Um, was translated into Yiddish in 1887. The present system was, quote, unjust, insane, and murderous, and must be destroyed through both, quote, peaceful education and revolutionary conspiracy. So a two-track two uh, strategy here. It was really the Haymarket um, trial and executions that really sort of uh, made the Yiddish group sort of get organized. The Pioneers of Liberty were founded on Yom Kippur Day, which I'll have a little bit more on about that, um, shortly after the death sentences were, were announced. Um, in fact, um, I hope this map, so imagine sort of, Again, the same kind of lower Manhattan there. So in fact, the first commemoration of the executions, so the year after 87, this was held on November 11, 1888. It seems to me one of the first joint public demonstrations by German and Yiddish anarchists. Um, it's, it, there's, I have some really good 
descriptions of this. And so basically they start off at Felix Brecht's Singerhalle, which, is, which was a main German anarchist beer hall, really. Um, and then so they march to Cooper Union, but they make a detour to pick up the, the Yiddish marchers right on, like, right on Forsyth Street on, in, in Houston. And then they go to Cooper Union and have their big public commemoration. Um, all right, uh, the, uh, representatives of both groups were on the organizing committee for this. This was a big, big headline grabbing sort of <laughs> demonstration. Um, and they, Yiddish and German delegates were, were involved in this. Uh, Yiddish anarchist club life was always advertised in Freiheit. Um, the pioneers of liberty financially contributed to Freiheit until they had their own newspaper, and then Most would raise money for that new Yiddish language newspaper. Um, I think at the heart of the bond between Most and the Yiddish anarchists was militant atheism. Um, I think it's a bit of an under-researched aspect of immigrant anarchism. It was really uh, integral, I think. Uh, it's important to know that Most became an atheist before becoming a socialist. It's probably true with some other figures. Um, in 1883, oh, so here is, um, this, this is an announce, you can't, the, I don't know what's wrong with the slide, but they, so this is simply announcing in Freiheit, in German, the, the sort of the, the meeting times of the Yiddish anarchist groups. So here's another uh, in Freiheit uh, Moss lecture. These were lecture series. He would talk about the French Revolution and all, the, he loved history. Um, and so this is the pioneers of liberty. That's the German, of course, but this is the most important Yiddish anarchist group. So a very symbiotic sort of relationship. Okay, back to militant atheism. So it's an important pamphlet that he writes, Most writes in 1883, Die Pest" or the God Pestilence. Um, it's, it's really a quite, it had a real sort of impact. Um, it, it is translated in Yiddish by the London comrades in 1888. Chaim Weinberg remembered that this pamphlet is that, that did it, that made me, not, not just an atheist, but made, made me adopt anarchism. So Must attacks basically the sort of man-made, as he sees it, monotheistic God as a brutal despot, holding humans, quote, under eternal divine police surveillance. Um, <laughs> He argued that religion has always served the powerful, and for these reasons, this is important, anti-religious militancy must be part of the anarchist movement. So, quote, every person released from deistic superstition, forbearing to oppose priesthood where and when and however an opportunity presents itself as a traitor to his cause. So you have, you, you, it's not... This is, for immigrant anarchists, it's not, it's not just an intellectual debate, right? You have to be a militant about it and, and uh, uh, direct action against capitalist oppression. So beginning in 1889, New York's Yiddish anarchist organized a ball with food and drink on Yom Kippur Day, Day of Atonement, with the express purpose to mock and undermine orthodoxy. The London comrades had sort of initiated this. And this, uh, this is in the press almost every year. They, there's a comment and they, there's always a confrontation, uh, but that's what they, what they want. They, to my knowledge, the, the Jewish anarchists in New York keep this up. There's maybe some years where it's like prevented, but until 1909, and it spreads to other cities. Like the, I found a, a, an, an episode like that in, uh, in Baltimore in 1890. Um, so this is Fry, so my, most of my sources are of course German sources, but this is Fry had basically, um, I don't know if you could read this, but, but sort of announcing it, but also say, yes, good, good thing. Most always thought it was a great idea. He participated in almost every one of them. This is, uh, I don't have time to go through it, if you know German, it basically is, here's how we 
fundraise off of that and then divide the funds. So you see there, $10 for Freiheit, $10 for Freie Gesellschaft, which was a Yiddish, another Yiddish publication, and then $5 we sent to London. So they, that's, that's, this is a thing. Um, um, I could uh, maybe quickly tell you about the 1890 Brooklyn Yom Kippur ball was, was prevented because the rabbis had complained to the police and this became a, a huge story, not just in the anarchist press. Um, and then there was a protest meeting, uh, and uh, they, I think, Fry had called the, called the shutout. They were shut out. Fry had called it Levi terrorism. And one, one other that sort of must have stung was czarism in America. So, okay, a few last remarks. This is about the passing of the torch that I think happens in the late 1890s from the aging splintered German movement to a youthful Yiddish movement. Little Germany had become the Jewish ghetto. Freie Arbeiter Stimme was revived in 1899. Um, I think there's a number of reasons for it. One has sort of been alluded to, the rank and file was really important for the Yiddish movement, was, was in the sort of garment workers, the exploited garment workers. The German movement was really rooted in the sort of narrow craft-based industries. Uh, the historian Paul Buell has argued that one of the strengths of Jewish radicalism is its peculiar cosmopolitanism. Um, and the German one became sort of insular, insularity, sitting in their beer halls. And um, there is, um, I want to quote a, this is 1895. This is a Staten Island mainstream newspaper. It used to be said a few years ago that the rallying point of the red flag socialist in New York was always a, la a German lager beer saloon. But nowadays, one does not look in New York for anarchists among the Germans, but among the Russian Jews on the East Side. So if I may wrap up here with, the, with the, what, how I started, I think anarchism endured in America, largely because the Yiddish movement sort of carried it into the 20th century, the ideas and practices. Um, don't have to take my work for it. Chaim Weinberg, again, was 45 years old when Most died. He wrote, the German anarchist workers with Most as writer and speaker not only created a powerful, influential German anarchist movement in America, but also helped create a Jewish as well as an American anarchist movement. That's it. Thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Ana Elena Torres will present on the horizon blossoms and the borders vanish, anarchist aesthetics in Yiddish poetry. She is an assistant professor of comparative literature at the University of Chicago. Her forthcoming book is titled, Any Minute Now, The World Streams Over Its Border, Anarchism and Yiddish Literature. This project examines the literary production, language politics, and religious thought of Jewish anarchist movements from 1870 to the present in Moscow, Tel Aviv, London, Buenos Aires, New York City, and elsewhere. Torres' work has appeared in Jewish Quarterly Review, in Geveb, Nashim, Makeshift, and the anthology Feminisms in Motion, a Decade of Intersectional Feminist Media. Hi, everybody. How are you doing today? Yeah, uh, it's really beautiful to see you all here. And it's also beautiful to come down from the microfilm machine upstairs and get to share downstairs some of all of the treasures um, that, are, that we have in the archive. So thank you, Yivo, and to the organizers um, and to all the brilliant co-panelists. Um, hi, Mom. Hi, Papi. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm really excited to be here today and to talk about the literature and the aesthetic influence of Yiddish anarchism. This was a movement that made the struggle for artistic expression 
and the struggle for free speech one of its central aims, and its press spanned the continents from Moscow and Tel Aviv to Buenos Aires and New York City. Today I want to give you uh, just a taste of what's a very deep and very rich archive uh, of Yiddish uh, anarchist literature. So I'm going to start uh, briefly with the earlier period of anarchist writing in the 1880s and 1890s when the relationship between poetry and the movement was most explicit. Um, then I'm going to speak more about the experimental and modernist trends and talk about how anarchist thought and aesthetics persisted after World War I and World War II within Yiddish literature by focusing on the poet Peretz Markish, um, who I argue was profoundly informed by anarchist aesthetics and whose later work indicts the Soviet state control of art. Um, as has been outlined earlier, uh, anarchism refers to a whole constellation of aspirations, working towards bodily autonomy, towards ethical consensus, towards a world without borders and domination. Art and literature played a key role in developing the imagination of this kind of radical future. Um, for the Yiddish anarchists, they were able to use poetic techniques, um, effects like bending time, unbordering nature, in order to prefigure a world after and beyond the state. Uh, yes, so what do the Yiddish anarchists say about poetry? Um, I would argue that we can't simply transfer models of Yiddish communism or socialist poetry onto the anarchists, because the anarchist ideal of art as liberation diverged from these communist models of art as duty, art as propaganda. For example, the poet Aaron Glantz Leilis maintains that, quote, poetry must be a helping tool, not to mention the maidservant of the labor movement, and all leaders must make it a part of socialist duty to compose poetry. In contrast to that communist model of what art or poetry has to be, the Yiddish poet and editor Yosef Ludin describes, quote, a deep bond between anarchism and literature. The difference is that Marxists mainly assail economic facts and concern themselves with the material side of the state regime, whereas anarchism is not content with that but occupies itself passionately with intellectual production. Anarchism has never been an established policy, but a movement in process, according to Yosef Ludin. Um, and as Kenyon said, uh, Yiddish anarchists published more than 20 newspapers in the US, 12 of them founded between 1889 and World War I. Uh, during this period, a movement flourished that we call sweatshop or proletarian poetry. Um, a strident and yearning sweatshop poetry is epitomized by the work of Morris Rosenfeld, David Edelstadt, and Morris Winchevsky, whose De Zukunft, the future, foretells a transformed world where the mourner will become a singer, all will become brothers, and truth will grow, grow dearer, dearer like a friend. Um, and in these verses, we can hear the echoes of Isaiah 61 too about the restoration of ruined cities, when mourners will be comforted and captives will be freed. Um, so thinking also about this as a kind of Jewish anarchist poetics. David Edelstadt's poem, Dos is Anarchy, This is Anarchy, idealizes a future where, quote, freedom will bring fortune for all, the weak and the strong, the he and the she. And in Yosef Bovshiver's poem, Revolution, which is behind me, um, he writes, quote, I come like a comet newborn, like the sun that arises at morning. I come like the furious tempest that follows a thundercloud's warning. Um, but I want to say that despite these very ecstatic visions of the future, theirs was not necessarily an absolute res revolution. Um, as the Yiddish anarchist editor Rudolf Rocker, who's been mentioned earlier, uh, Rocker said, quote, I'm not an anarchist because I believe anarchism is the final goal. I'm an anarchist because there is no such thing as a final goal. The sweatshop poet's futurity echoes both what Rocker is saying and also contemporary theorists, um, such as Jose Esteban Munoz, who says, quote, the queer futurity that I'm describing is not an end, but an opening or horizon. It's a being in, a being towards, and a being for the future. Um, so I want us to kind of think also about these kind of radical echoes between, uh, between these movements. Um, well, the, the sweatshop poems are often anthologized as though they were only historical documents about labor rather than as themselves having integrity as literature. Um, I want to emphasize that they were, politic they were poetically innovative in their disruption of capitalist time. Rosenfeld's poem, The Sweatshop, for example, is structured as a schedule of the working day where the clock becomes anthropomorphized as a boss, 
and the clock starts to scream so, so at the workers. When the lunch hour strikes in that hour of freedom, the dead come to life and visions of the world to come appear. Time is liberated, flowing beyond the clock's regulation. The lunch hour becomes an island in time, hours a stream with no dam. And so just from that, that brief caption, right, you can hear that Rosenfeld is capturing the ebb and the flow of an alienated self over the course of the workday, not through repetitive slogans or flat language, but through inventive metaphor, right? Um, and uh, here are just a couple images from uh, Arte Freund, edited by Rudolf Rocker, who I quoted. Uh, you can see some of the aesthetics, right? This is a very kind of romantic aesthetic that they have. Um, and here's a beautiful photo of the editors having a picnic in 1905 um, from, the, from the London paper. Um, uh, yes, the style of the sweatshop poets spanned languages and Emma Goldman's English language paper, Mother Earth, which is here, tended to print poetry in a very similar style of labor romanticism, which is to say that there was a kind of single style spreading across Yiddish language and uh, English language anarchist poetry. Um, and this affinity between the Yiddish and the uh, Yiddish and English anarchist literature continued in the modernist period. Uh, Kenyon mentioned Frei Arbiter Stima, which was as much a literary journal as it was a radical broadside. And while Solyanovsky, the editor, was launching the careers of Yiddish modernist writers, the most influential English language modernist journal in the U.S., which was Margaret Anderson's uh, the Little Review was largely an anarchist publication as well. Uh, so I want to emphasize thinking comparatively about what was happening in anarchist literature, both in English and in Yiddish at the same time. And here we have the two editors who are also partners, Jane Heap and Margaret Anderson. Um, Anderson's serialized publication of James Joyce's Ulysses until 1921, when copies of the magazine were confiscated by the post office for obscenity, and Anderson and Jane Heap were charged with indecency. Um, from looking at the addresses on the correspondence of the Yiddish anarchists, because this is what historians do, we're very nosy, we go through your mail a hundred years later, uh, but from looking at all of the addresses on the envelopes, I can see that some of the Yiddish anarchists were actually working out of their offices. We have check stubs showing that they were materially supporting um, the editors uh, here in their fight for free speech. And so there are very particular physical and material ways in which Yiddish anarchism was trying to make the world safe for literary modernism. Um, in the same time, uh, oh yes, and here's a passage from Margaret Anderson, which has this quotation, right? Uh, most people know that, uh, most enlightened people know that anarchists are usually timid, thoughtful, unviolent people. Dynamite is not a part of their intellectual but not their physical uh, personality, right? Um, all right, and so in the same period, um, we can look, and I don't have time unfortunately today, but this very striking illustration of kind of judge death uh, is illustrating uh, poetry and documents about the Sacco Vanzetti trial. There were something like 144 poems written about the Sacco Vanzetti trial. Uh, so again, literature was a, a form of a poetic response to what was happening in the, in the Yiddish anarchist movement. Um, Yiddish modernism also blossomed in Europe and Russia, and one of the most significant journals was Khaliastra, the gang, which appeared in Warsaw in 1922. One engraving depicts three boisterous figures in marching for formation, arms aloft in the shape of the letter Aleph, and that's this one you can see. They're literally on the vanguard, right? Um, the title of the journal Khaliastra proclaims their identity as a band roaming like medieval guilds of troubadours beyond the frontiers of accepted taste. One of its editors, Peretz Markish, published a manifesto on the first page declaring, And so we go scattered one by one and all together in anarchist bands and federations. And so we here have a moment of an experimental manifesto, right, written in Warsaw, that's explicitly identifying themselves as an anarchist group. Um, uh, Markish also came in contact with anarchism when he lived in the city of Ekaterinoslav, which was a key site for the Black Army, um, the Ukrainian uh, anarchist army led by Nestor Makhno, uh, the so-called Cossack of Anarchy, who personally saved the life of Peretz Markish's uh, father-in-law. So there are all of these historical echoes between uh, Markish and, and the anarchist movement as well. Um, 
here he is in all of his glory. Um, while primarily canonized as a communist poet, Markish's work is also deeply informed by anarchist aesthetics and ideals, especially his posthumous masterpieces. Hours before his arrest at Stalin's order in 1949, Markish gave his wife Esther several manuscripts. Among these was Der Fetziger Karman, The Man of Forty, a virtuosic and deeply enigmatic 80-page poem. The poem moves between expressionist scenes of war and revolution to visions of borderless space, radical temporality, and erotic liberation. As he handed her the manuscript, Markish told his wife, quote, this is the best thing I've ever done and I want you to take special care of it. His wife arranged for the manuscripts to be smuggled out of the country in a potato sack, saving work that Markish had begun in 1922 while editing Kaleastra, the journal, and continually rewrote over 27 years. The poem was finally published in 1978 in Tel, in Tel Aviv. The Man of Forty pulses with the sounds and images of unfinished insurgency, often recalling the sweatshop poet's revolutionary temporality, as in these lines, quote, smashed are the clocks of capital and cities, smashed is the order of hours and days, overturned, the calendar hangs on the other side, already withering, melting. So here you can see some of the echoes, right, of the Rosenfeld poem that I read earlier, this idea of overturning time, overturning capitalist time and the structure of wage labor. For decades, Markish kept the poem hidden deep in his desk drawer, fearing the state's response to its subversive politics. The scholar Hannah Kronfeld writes, quote, the man of 40 is at once his most Jewish and his most anarchist book, and I believe it's the key to his life's work. Its anarchism, I argue, may be located in its poetic defiance of totalitarianism, its exuberant subversion of state communist iconography, and its central concern with the figure of the refugee. Against the USSR's policy of closed borders, the poem rhetorically abolishes all borders of time and territory, quote, Sebrochen der Stern, Sevolga Tetsam, Merkonen Schangen über Luft über Jam, Neto is kein Egens, Neto is kein Fremd, Willich oisten dem Treuer, wie ich to oise hemd. The obstacle is smashed and the borders demolished. We can pass now through air over sea. Property is no more. There's no ours, no theirs. And I take off my grief like I take off my shirt. In a recently declassified 1949 report written to Stalin, he urged the dismantlement of the Jewish writing associations in the Soviet Union and cited Markish specifically for, quote, expressing nationalist tendencies because of the Jewish content and some of the vocabulary of Markish's poetry. Um, and if you look at the galley proofs of Markish's last book, you can see where the censor crossed out in red every time he were, uses the word Yid, Jew, and recommended that it be replaced with a universalist term like man or passerby. Um, and uh, we can also know because of these galley proofs, um, as his wife recalled, quote, the only thing we could count on was the abysmal ignorance and stupidity of the censors. They couldn't make head nor tail of difficult poetry, so they gave it's okay, right? So they, they didn't understand the metaphor, but they saw the word Jew and they would take that out. Um, censors let slip by a section containing coded but furiously anti-communist passages in this poem. Um, Markish depicts red monks, monachen, as self-castrated bureaucrats. Quote, by Nacht in the Heilen and Heilen mit der Lecht, sie schneiden Verfrumkeit sich aus das Geschlecht. Night in the caverns, in a cave with a piercer, piously they excise their sex. So this is his metaphor of censorship. Um, and the pettiness of these red monks with stars on their sleeves, he describes as very inhuman. But the poem ends, quote, Nor jung is der Tog und frisch is der Tog und sub Grotze die Sonne ist wie Flecken von Tol. But young is the day and fresh is the day and the sun will scorch them to stains in the valley. Um, but the bureaucratic censors couldn't recognize these uh, trifling doomed monks as portraits of themselves. And so they let the poem be published because they didn't understand the metaphor. Um, but also in this passage, Markish takes up the style of Bovshiver and Edelstadt, deploying it, taking up the proletarian style and deploying it against state censorship, adapting the original form of sweatshop poetry into a new and Baroque level of metaphor. Uh, in short, Markish's poetry was also formed as a response to the condition of censorship. Um, in poem 40 of part one, the poetic speaker encounters the body of a soldier left by the side of the road. The corpse's bones resemble schrift or handwriting in a manuscript. 
the refrain of the Yom Kippur prayer, who by water and who by fire, is parodied by Markish as who by hammer and who by sickle. While the profound erasure of Jewish anarchist history has obscured these aspects of Markish's writing, in his own era, critics recognized the anarchist character of Markish's poetry. In 1923, the London newspaper Arbeiter Freins, I showed its beautiful uh, banner before, um, reviewed Markish's poetry, claiming, quote, Markish the Jew, the anarchist, walks with the heavy baggage of his people, a bleeding and wounded vagabond like Shimon among refugees and ruined ones. Markish's depth of being together with comrades is apparent. Here he is more comrade than poet. Here he is ours. From his very first published Russian poem as a teenager, which was titled Grenitsa or Border, to his last Yiddish work, the theme of the borderland remains central. This enthrallment is striking for a poet in a country with the world's longest border, where free movement was made illegal barely two months after the Russian Revolution, and Jews' freedom of movement had been restricted earlier as, quote, an incitement to sedition. Against such realities, in 1935, Markish published a poem titled Moscow, imagining that city as the site from which redemption bursts into the world. Quote, the horizon is putting on blossom, the realms are opening, and the borders are vanishing. The contemporary anarchist philosopher Thomas Nail writes, quote, borders are more like motors, the mobile cutting blades of society. And in Markish's poems, the border is often rendered as a space of violence, far wunden randen, a wound on the edge of the earth. Yet that wound can be healed, as in poem 33, where he is describing dawn. And now I'm going to read you some poetry. Quote, a waving, a winging, a twittering strikes. The forest is filled with joy, replenished by song. Any minute now, the world will stream over its border, anointing with shine and golden drink. Just reach out your hands and tug at the mouth of the bare body, at the bare skin. And I'm here too, I'm fated to be upon earth at joy of daybreak. In another poem in the same book, Markish Hill's human kinship with land beyond property and ownership, quote, is this not spring heaped and multiplied upon spring? When children gather, they flock together. And what is a border and what is a limit when children are springing from land to land? And what could be forbidden to them after all when the earth rushes to meet them? And in its final pages, the man of 40 returns to this radiant eroticism foretelling an ecstatic future, quote, Multitudes upon multitudes arrive with joy. You hear no ripple of air, no flutter of flag. Faces bright as the flags of dawn. All is knowable and sunlit and clear. A day like a watermelon sliced open. Juice streams out, bright streams out. Sunsap pours forth, sunsap gushes. One wants to take the whole world in one's hands. Slowly take her together as one. Oh, there's still a wound. Here it still aches. Here it's unhealed, I there's still a scar, and somewhere a flesh wound's still oozing. She's barefoot, she steps on glass, stung by a wreath of thorny wire, and where it's neglected, where it's burnt up, still take her in your own hands. And so this is the final, the final passage of this 80-page poem that he rewrote for 30 years and hid, and his wife had to smuggle out of the Soviet Union, and it, en it ends on this uh, kind of erotic utopian note. Um, where masses assemble without energy, without ideology. You hear no ripple of air, no flutter of flag, faces bright as the flags of dawn. And in this moment of lucidity, banners and slogans are replaced only by the irreducible human face, in contrast to the image earlier in the poem, where there's a flag shoved into the armpit of a soldier's corpse, reducing the fullness of life to a single symbol. Here at the end of the poem, the smuggled poem, the body of the earth remains libidinous and resilient, unbordered though wounded, undeterred by a, a land strewn with weapons. This female figure walks on into the future. And I want to end by saying that uh, The Man of Forty was written by a deportee who is held behind the earth's longest border, yet he still prefigures a restless space with no flutter of flag, where the earth exceeds and overthrows its own borders, taking up in a modernist and experimental fashion the style and the form of earlier generations of anarchist poetry, especially the proletarians like Bob Shiver. 
As a reviewer at Arbor de Freins wrote in 1923, quote, Marcus sings with wind and hurricanes, with the creative unrest of a furious world, carrying within himself the strength of Prometheus to hasten and scorch worlds and build other more beautiful worlds in their place. And so I would say that in spite of, or perhaps to spite, Soviet state ownership of time, of his time, Marcus's writing can still prefigure another temporality, neither the untroubled utopia deferred after the revolution, nor a kind of co-opted nationalist past, but rather a present that contains all possibility within itself, despite it all, a day like a watermelon sliced open, juice streams out, bright streams out. Thank you very much to all the panelists. Uh, we are ready to take your questions. I think we have, do we have two people who will run the microphones? And if you raise your hands so I can, oh, will you come down? Yeah. A question on, on the um, Yiddish as a defining uh, characteristic. Did, the, did this generation aspire to sustain Yiddish so that, and expand it to, to, to include non-Yiddish speakers in any way? Or did they think that they were moving toward English, which would be more expansive and be able to, to cross language borders? How important was Yiddish? To, the, to them. Are you, are you addressing your question to a particular speaker? Uh, to, the, to the speaker who's nodding in recognition. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, no, that, that, that's a fantastic question. Um, so really up until immigration restrictions are, are imposed in the 1920s, um, it seemed like a, a perfectly uh, sustainable and uh, reasonable strategy to invest in Yiddish culture, Yiddish language, and to sort of Yiddishize anarchism for Jewish immigrants because you had them streaming in. Um, now, of course, after World War I and, and immigration restrictions, that no longer becomes sustainable and it creates sort of a long-term crisis um, for the Yiddish-speaking anarchist movement. But so, the, but up until that, that point, right, the, the idea of fostering a specifically Yiddish anarchist movement um, the, the idea wasn't that they were going to universalize Yiddish or that they, or that they were going to adopt a universalized English. It was, it, it was really a vision of a cosmopolitan, multilingual, multi-ethnic, multi-racial anarchist movement in the United States and the world, right? And the, so at the same time that these anarchists are investing in, in Yiddish and building Yiddish culture, they are, you know, they're also applauding other linguistic and, and cultural groups that are doing the same. They don't see these as, as um, contradictory or, or in competition, but rather, um, right, sort of each linguistic and, and cultural group um, should focus on fostering culture and radicalism in its own language. Um, and of course, what we haven't really, I mean, Tom talked about this a little bit, multilingualism is sort of in the background here, because almost all of these people we're talking about are multilingual. Um, they're just, so some speak Russian and Yiddish, some speak German and Yiddish, some speak English and Yiddish. Um, so even as they're sort of, uh, right, sort of throw, putting their eggs in the basket of Yiddish anarchism, many of these people also have one foot in, right, in Emma Goldman's circle around Mother Earth or in Johann Most circle around Freiheit. Um, so in other words, you could be a Yiddish anarchist and an American or English speaking anarchist. You could be a Yiddish anarchist and a Russian anarchist at the same time and sort of exist and move between those two spaces. Um, but there is very much a, a, a focus and it became more explicit over time of fostering and keeping alive the sort of linguistic and cultural diversity as a positive good, 
in, in, in and of itself. Um, I think uh, if I can add to that, one of the interesting things about Yiddish anarchist language politics to me uh, is that there was not a debate about what will be the Jewish language, right? The way that there was a Bundist debate about uh, how, uh, how Yiddish will become the international workers' language, or a Zionist debate about how there can only be a single language of the Jewish state. Instead, we had Harkavi, as Kenyon mentioned, writing a trilingual dictionary, right? Uh, Rudolf Rocker, uh, who was a German speaker, but he also, in accounts of his son, Fermin Rocker, um, Fermin discusses oh. how his father also spoke Spanish and would organize with comrades uh, from Spain in London, although he's, he's really remembered more for his Yiddish, but he also had you know, uh, these, these multilingual spheres. So it was not a debate about what will be the Jewish language, the way that we had in other Jewish uh, political movements. Uh, well, I, I could maybe something I thought about in this with this question is what I remember one of the so the Yiddish anarchists organize an annual convention of all the Jewish groups in the in the U.S. really, and I, I, one issue that came up is like we we need an English language speaker to to come to the U.S. and uh, there wasn't. There weren't that many in the, in, 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 I guess, in the U.S., but and I think Charles Mowbray was one of the English that if, who eventually come. But they're they're really discussing this not not because Yiddish is sort of not a good language, but just for propaganda purposes in the U.S. But language that's a big discussion among the Germans too. And by the way, Moss never learned Yiddish, unlike Rocker, for example. Another interesting thing is that there was some uh, backlash against the Yiddish-speaking anarchists by Jewish-English-speaking anarchists who saw the fact that they were using a minor language um, to evade censorship as a kind of sellout or uh, something rather cowardly about the fact that they weren't writing in English when they could. Emma Goldman, for example, uh, refused at a certain point to speak Yiddish in public because she said she wanted the FBI to know exactly what she was saying. <laughs> Um, but we can also look at some of the bilingual Yiddish and anarchist newspapers, for example, Freiheit from 1918, and see what was it that they could say in Yiddish that they couldn't say in English? What was it that they were saying in English that they were not saying in Yiddish? Um, yes. Any other comments? Questions? What was their position on non-political economic radicalism like Henry George, uh, linguistic radicalism like Esperanto. Uh, did, I mean, there was, this seems to be a comfort zone that they might have been, you know, friendly with. Um, yeah, so Henry George is an interesting example because you do have examples of uh, Jewish anarchists and, and other anarchists who largely subscribe to Henry George's sort of single tax uh, movement as, as a sort of intermediary step, you know, right, a short-term reform on, on the road um, to anarchism. Uh, you even had anarchists who were members of Georgist settlements and colonies um, in, in the United States. Um, but I that was definitely sort of a, a, a small stream uh, within the, the larger movement. Um, and Esperanto, yes. Lots of anarchists were, were, were gaga for, for Esperanto. You know, they, they held Esperanto classes. They published newspapers in Esperanto, although none published in the United States that I can think of. Um, but for example, the first anarchist newspaper in China was published in Esperanto and corresponded with Emma Goldman's Mother Earth because they could right, bridge that gap with Esperanto. Um, but of course, Esperanto never really took root the way that, that they hoped. Um, I think that there was, uh, just speaking to the uh, language politics aspect of your question, there was some, uh, some resistance towards having a politics of language in the same mode. For example, when I in interviewed uh, Audrey Goodfriend um, many years ago, and I said, you know, Frau Abitur Stima continued to run from 1890 to 1977 and a half. Why is it that, uh, why did you continue to write in Yiddish? Did you have a politics of Yiddish? Did you see Yiddish as a kind of holy language in a secular way. Uh, and Audrey said to me in her Bronx accent, we spoke, I wrote in Yiddish because Yiddish is the language I spoke best. What are you, an academic? 
<laughs> uh, fortunately, at that time, I was not. Um, <laughs> Uh, but there is also, uh, I think we can't really import some of the language politics of the Bund to talk about uh, the Yiddish anarchist context, but there were certainly utopian aspects. Um, for example, uh, Zev Gordon, the brother of uh, Abu Gordon in Moscow in Anarchia, he had this idea to invent what he thought would be the most perfect language mathematically, and it would communicate with, uh, this was kind of the beginning of the space race, um, uh, and so the idea was that they would have a mathematical language that could, if we ever meet the extraterrestrials, communicate with them so perfectly. So this will be a new cosmic scientific language. He wrote a whole dictionary. Uh, and Yevgeny Fix, the artist who's here today, is also very interested in this and has been doing some beautiful artwork around uh, Yiddish space utopian language. So check it out. Comment from you? I, I don't have, I, I mean, all I know, I mean, Moss, the, the only thing Moss did with George, I think, is just bash him. <laughs> I, think, I mean, he, I, I, I remember most writing something about him because of his mayoral campaign in 1886, which went on, I believe, right when the Haymarket trial was, but he, because Moss was not for the eight hour day necessarily in that period, and that, I think that was a big part of George's campaign. Thanks. The uh, messianic vision of the messianic vision of Isaiah, which was mentioned in your lecture, it's also used extensively on a regular basis, both in Christianity and Judaism. But in a real world of what you have to deal with death and taxes, uh, this is this is a great ideal, which is very difficult to to realize. So uh, when we look at the practicality of, of the world, one has to wonder how the anarchist ideals, which are similar to Isaiah, can be realized in a practical way. So can you, I mean, there was not a system in the world, you know, coming, we had communism, right? And uh, which is failed. What, what would be the practical reason to put the anarchistic ideals into reality? Um, uh, uh, <laughs> who would like to answer this? <laughs> uh, uh, I can say, I think, about, about the role of, of culture, right? If you are saying that anarchism is an anti-political movement, it's not about politics party politics. It's about the sphere of culture, and culture is going to be the realm of transformation of society. Um, then art and literature is extraordinarily important in developing a kind of everyday culture. Um, and part of it is about uh, the transformation of kinship and comradeship and a different mode of relating between individuals. And I think that's part of what they saw uh, art doing, right? If you go on a, on a steamship up the Hudson River with your Italian comrades and your Yiddish comrades and you sing together, this is trying to form a new everyday life, right? It's trying to form a kind of anarchist minhag, right? A kind of daily practice. And through that everydayness, through the kind of mundane details of life, there can be some form of transformation. Yeah, so I don't have an answer to that, but I can <laughs> tell you the answer that the Yiddish anarchists sort of eventually settled upon. Um, because in the early years when they were very close to, to Johann Moos and the Germans and influenced by them, there was a lot of right, the conspiracy and, and sort of right, dynamite. Um, but that rather quickly faded, and the, the Yiddish-speaking anarchist movement and its organs like the Freie Arbeiter Stimme uh, developed a, a sort of evolutionary rather than revolutionary approach to right, social tr transformation. They began to realize right, this Transformation is a long way off still. It's not just around the corner like, like we initially thought. Um, and they sort of developed a, a you could say, say a, a four-pronged approach, uh, which was one, right, uh, being active in, in the, the union movement, the working class movement, and trying to radicalize it and, and right, infuse it with anarchist ideas. Um, second was the realm of culture, um, and very much, yes, yeah, so, right, changing how people thought about the world around them and interacted with it. Uh, education, 
So this was both educating adults, but, but more importantly, educating children in a sort of libertarian manner, founding the, the, the Ferrer Modern School in, initially in Harlem, and then it moved to Stilton, New Jersey, and really trying to right, educate subsequent generations in a different way that would make these sorts of social relations possible. Um, and then finally, uh, trying to find, build alternatives outside of capitalism in the form of, of cooperatives, be they living cooperative, uh, productive cooperatives, or consumer cooperatives. And that was sort of what they saw as a long, long-term strategy to try to, to achieve that end. Yeah, I, I, I second bo both of those answers. I mean, it's, it's even, so yes, you're right. Johan Most was, it was in the 80s, especially sort of known for this insurrectionary talk and dynamite and condoning certain political violence and assassinations. I, but I think in, this is what I argued in my book, Beer and Revolution, um, which is available in, no, I'm just, <laughs> um, but I, I argued that even, so there is that rhetoric, but then there is this other, um, I think in, what is it, in the 60s, they call it prefigurative politics. So it's, it's, so they have these, you know, like the beer, the saloons, and the, the, the I think I argued those were little sort of mini, anarchist worlds, if that makes sense, in the here and now. So we practice and you know, theater groups and picnics and so that I think it's, it's important to, to get past some of the rhetoric sometimes that Most was really good at, although I, to my knowledge he never really committed a, a, a violent crime. So. Okay. Uh. Hi, this is mostly for Professor Torres, um, but I think in a lot of um, sort of leftist or radical Jewish spaces now, there's a sort of idea, maybe we'll hear more about this later, but that Yiddish is intrinsically or historically a political or subversive or anarchist language. And then I think also, at least in a large part of sort of Yiddish modernism, the Yiddish language was heavily theorized and thematized in various ways. And I wonder if we find that kind of work going on in the anarchist tradition of literature or if there's a totally different approach to the language in these questions. <laughs> no, I'm just thinking. <laughs> so uh, the, the very long poem that I mentioned, the 80 page poema that was smuggled out, um, it was published in Tel Aviv in 1978 and it includes facsimile copies where you can see Markish's own handwriting, and then it's published in typeface. And, it, and this is very interesting too, because uh, as some folks might know, uh, books, um, uh, Soviet Yiddish had its own orthography. Well, actually there were four different kinds of Soviet orthography. Um, one aspect of it was rewriting uh, uh, uh words, so the Hebrew Aramaic component of Yiddish into a more phonetic, phonetic way as a way of kind of visually uh, cutting the umbilical cord between a religious component of the language and the Soviet language of the day. And so the book becomes an interesting document of the peregrinations, the journeys of Yiddish, because you see that Markish is writing in Soviet phonetic type, and then it's being published in an Israeli book, respelled into standard Yiddish. Um, so perhaps we could even think of that as a kind of multilingual text, you know, in that it preserves the accent or the dialect or the place in which it was written um, in that way. Thank you very, oh, one more. Yeah. Oh, I, I, this is for uh, Anna Lanham uh, Torres. Uh, unless I'm mistaken, <clears throat> I read in uh, Joshua Rubenstein, Stalin's Secret, uh, <laughs> what's that? A, a book about Stalin killing the, the Yiddish poets, and also a, a biography of Paul Robeson that uh, <clears throat> Peretz Markish was a functionary in the NKVD. Uh, if you could comment on that and what the relationship is between that and his anarchist and uh, a secret uh, poetical work. Sure. 
Um, so I would not be so bold as to say that Pirates Markish was a straight up anarchist who is a member of any anarchist federation, any more than I would say that Beyonce is a member of the Black Panthers because she wears a beret in her music videos, right? I think, <laughs> I think that there's, there's a, a kind of aesthetic, this is operating on an aesthetic level, there's a kind of play with the movement and invocation of the anarchist ideals. Um, he, was, he was an anti-fascist, he was a member of the Communist Party. Uh, however, what I do want to nuance is the fact that he received the Stalin Prize and the Lenin Prize, and this was sometimes seen as evidence of him as a state functionary. Uh, however, Avram Sutskever recalls that the moment when he was informed that he was being given the, the Stalin Prize, he went completely gray and the blood drained out of his face, because this was actually a way of controlling him by giving him the award rather than lifting him up. Um, this was a way of controlling his movement, of reminding him that the state's eyes were on him. Um, so sometimes it said, yes, he was only a communist poet. In fact, he was lauded by, uh, by the state and he was a state poet, right? He did write these, these odes, um, which I find less poetically interesting. Um, but, but I also want to say that, you know, there are these accounts, for example, that he was the only person who would refuse to clap in events honoring, um, honoring state functionaries. So I'm not sure about that particular passage that you cited. Um, but I do want to say that there's quite quite space, and similarly with Mayakovsky's early anarchism, and then Mayakovsky later becoming a state poet. Um, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in that. Thank you. Thank you for coming to the morning panel. This is your time for lunch. Thank you to all the speakers. We come back at two o'clock. Oh, thank you all for returning. For those of you who are in the Great Hall, please know uh, those of you who, have, who are here for the first time, weren't here for the morning session, there is uh, more space in the Kovno room upstairs and there are arrows pointing to it. Uh, and also you can go upstairs to the balcony and watch the screen from around there if, if the Great Hall fills up. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce um, panel number two, and uh, I hope you all had an enjoyable lunch. Thank you. Welcome back. Welcome to those who weren't here. I'm Julie Rubin. I'm really excited to introduce panel number two. And so will our panelists come on stage, please? Okay, our first panelist is Reynolds or Rennie Hahamovich, who's a recent graduate of history and Jewish studies and master's student from the Central European University in Budapest. He specializes in the history of Jewish radicalization, of Jewish radicalism, I'm sorry, Eastern European Jewish migration to the United States, the Yiddish language, literature, and publishing and working class culture. His work on Yiddish anarchism has led him to the history of urban utopianism, science fiction, and social engineering in the 20th century. Hamovich currently teaches it, uh, about Yiddish anarchism among other historical Jewish topics at a high school in Budapest and conducts research at the Visegrad as a Visegrad Fellow at the Open Society Archivum, or Archivum. Ready? Thanks so much. Um, it's a magical touch to get this right, I think. Um, so yeah, thank you so much to, to all the organizers, um, and to Julie, of course. I, I just want a uh, shameless plug before we begin is that I am a product of three Yiddish programs, the Tel Aviv, uh, Vilna, and Yivo, and I would like to recommend them all to you, to anyone who's interested in Yiddish, whether you are 
uh, maybe an older Jew rediscovering uh, Yiddish roots or a younger Jew interested in Yiddish for the first time or not Jewish at all and interested in the history of Yiddish, the history of even uh, the Jewish left. Uh, it's a great opportunity. There's lots of funding as well that you can apply for, particularly if you're Eastern European. Evo offers a wonderful grant, which they gave to me because I live in Hungary and they did not check the form very carefully to see where I was actually from. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and also the Center for Jewish History offers many grants for young researchers, which you should avail yourself of if you are studying Jewish history. There's not very many grants available for MA students. We tend to be you know, outside of the realm of the PhD grants and undergrad grants, but the Center for Jewish History has a lot. The American Jewish, uh, AJH, S. Thank you. Yes. Uh, they gave me a wonderful grant, which is, it became this research project. So you should definitely um, look into these things. Uh, I also just like to thank the, the Evo archivists who do uh, an incredible amount of work here. Uh, it's a massive archive. Um, just to tell a, a quick anecdote about the archive, uh, Evo, or the Center for Jewish History Archive, I should say, is a little different than most archives. At most archives, there's, you know, somewhat elderly, archivists who run the front desk who you know have this incredible knowledge of every single page in the archive and then there's the young robust archivists who have to run around and get everything and at Evo it's the reverse um, and so sometimes you feel bad that you're uh, asking uh, people to run and grab uh, you know 30 boxes and then you send them back the next day um, and when I first got to Evo it was, it was my really my first research uh, experience as a historian and I I uh, went to go find some, from some anarchist documents, which had maybe been touched once in a hundred years. And I was told by the archivist that um, uh, they can't find them. Uh, so you should wait a few days because the archivist doesn't want to hurt his back looking for them. Um, <laughs> so I just want to say I'm sorry for all the burdens I put you through. And I'm glad that this stuff is, is finally seeing more and more light. Okay. So that's the end of the joyful stuff. Uh, April 24th, 1903, the Forverts. Rivers of Jewish blood flow in Kishinev, the capital of the Russian province of Bessarabia, where the Jewish quarter has been attacked by Christians. The pogromists broke into Jewish homes, slashing and shooting, hacking off heads, and stomping their feet on weak women and small children. 25 Jews had been murdered in Kishinev, and 275 were seriously wounded. This is a monument for the, a monumental event for the Jewish press and also for the non-Jewish press as well. The New York Times reported that the scenes of horror attending this massacre are beyond description. Babes were literally torn to pieces by the frenzied and bloodthirsty mob. The local police made no attempt to check the reign of terror. At sunset, the streets were piled with corpses and wounded. Those who could make their escape fled in terror and the city is now practically deserted of Jews. A survivor said that they snatched my one-year-old girl from my arms. One took it by the leg, another by the other, and tore it in twain. I begged them to kill me. Then they caught up my boy, eight years old, and chopped him to pieces. Um, so needless to say, this was not a good time to be a Jew in Russia. Uh, the late 19th and early 20th century was a period of enormous poverty and discontent across the Russian Empire, particularly for the country's massive Jewish population. Russia was highly economically unstable and only growing more oppressive under the Tsarist government, particularly since the assassination of the previous Tsar in 1881, I believe. Um, and which they were rescinding many of these so-called enlightenment policies that had been promised earlier, like the establishment of a parliament, the establishment of what we would now call civil rights. Um, so it was seen to be going in the reverse direction of most European countries. Inter-ethnic tension was stoked by nationalism and economic competition, most of all in the emperor, uh, empire's periphery, like Kishinev, where the majority of Russian Jews lived. The first pogroms had broken out in the 1880s. The pogrom is not a medieval word, like we often assume it is, in fact, a modern word. But these pogroms in the 1880s were relatively small. They were somewhat like lynchings of blacks going on in the US at the same time, where it was usually only a couple individuals targeted and maybe a few other people beaten up, or maybe a few stores robbed on the way. Uh, they weren't full-scale riots. Kishinev was. It was the beginning of a tradition of mass collective violence against Jewish communities as a whole, where the majority or a very large part of the majority community attacks the entire Jewish community. And conditions for Jews in uh, that area of Russia only grew worse after Kishinev. Survivors of the program uh, reported, there is distress and poverty in the whole land such as was, was never before known. Wealthy men have become poor, poor men are now beggars, and those who are beggars are starving to death. Reports stated that Jews in Warsaw had armed themselves with revolvers and stationed guards in the streets. In Romania, one correspondent claimed that the Christians of many towns proclaim openly that they will massacre all the Jews, and that the soldiers had said that they would help the pillaging once it starts. In short, the Kishinev program threw Russian Jews into a state of crisis, 
There were since the Chominsky massacres almost 250 years before, and Jewish papers, uh, Jewish papers everywhere reported on the rising sense of dread. That is, except the Yiddish anarchists. This is how the Freya Abrishtima, the main Yiddish uh, anarchist paper, which I will abbreviate as the FASH, as it was, ironically. Um, uh, this is how it f reported on the pogrom two weeks after it happened for the first time in a small column in the back pages. Quote, it is a little too early to say for sure what really occurred in this unfortunate city of Kishinev, because all the telegrams still coming now are very sparse in words. And as one can see in the many columns all across the Jewish daily papers, there was much to thank for the artistry of these fine writers, who only try to add some color to the reports, but end up concocting many details according to their own opinions. Though undoubtedly it was a terrifying massacre. Here, the Fash accuses the Jewish press of sensationalizing the pogrom, and then after adds that the massacre was terrible, but not because it had been of Jews, but that because it symbolized the, quote, wild, barbaric time which we now live in, where men can be so cruel. Saul Yanofsky, the editor of the Fash at that time, refused to privilege reports of anti-Jewish violence over any other type of violence. He pointed out that 9,000 Christians had just been slaughtered in Bosnia, but not a word of it made it into the Jewish press. He also criticized the demonstrations organized by Jews to get the American government to intervene in Russia, Theodore Roosevelt at that time. Let's not be foolish. The American government cannot act against the barbarism of the Russian government because its hands are also not free of blood. Um, one letter to the editor, this was a common um, trope in, in Yiddish papers at that time, agreed with Yanofsky, uh, calling the Vorwärts, the major Yiddish socialist paper, uh, a jingoistic troop of Jewish demagogues who were taking advantage of Jews and exaggerating their misfortune to sell papers. This was ultimately Yanofsky's conclusion on Kishinev. The Jews suffer in Russia, but so do many others. Indeed, maybe the beasts who committed the pogroms are really the greatest sufferers. For in their desperation, they were incensed by their demon oppressors who drew out the terrible beasts from within them. The Jews should learn to defend themselves, to fight like one who lives between two tigers. In the opinion of Yanofsky and many other Yiddish anarchists, the only thing that would ultimately save the Jews and the end Tsarist rule of Russia was a true social and political revolution. While another Jewish paper might claim that the pogroms, might blame the pogroms on the savagery of Christian peasants, Yiddish anarchists saw Jews and peasants as two halves of an oppressed working class cast against each other by the true enemy, the Tsar. This was a classical internationalist attitude. I'll explain what that means in a minute. The Farah Abedistimit essentially claimed that anti-Semitism, no matter how severe, was second to the oppression of the working class and could only be solved through class struggle. This dismissive attitude towards the Kishinev program encapsulates much of what made Yiddish anarchism unique among Jewish movements of that time. Um, to echo what was said about the Yiddish anarchist movement uh, earlier and, and to elaborate more, uh, at this point, the Yiddish anarchist movement identified broadly as an internationalist movement and rejected Jewish labels. So this before it had endorsed Yiddishkeit, so it was working in Yiddish, but it refused to see that it was building Yiddish culture or building a Jewish culture. This was true of most anarchists. Um, and they saw the use of Yiddish as pragmatic. Uh, a good example would be the Hebrew Labor Federation, which was a, a short-lived union that was a prototype for many other Jewish unions in the 19th century, which said that um, they held signs at their conferences that said, we are not Jews, we are Yiddish-speaking socialists. Um, and they also said that the reason we use Yiddish is to dissolve it. The internationalist hope, um, generally speaking, was that all ethnicities um, are just the source of nationalism, that they would eventually fade and that we would just be one beautiful anarchist radical people. Um, other Jewish leftists had previously maintained a similar view, uh, but most had moved away from it in the previous decades. People like Abraham Kahan, the editor of the Socialist Four Verts, had found that a more moderate stance that embraced certain aspects of Jewish culture and the idea of Jews as a people was a much more effective means of radicalization. And if the popularity of the Four Verts is any evidence, he was right. But the anarchists were the most internationalist of any of the many factions of radical Jewish movements at that time, and thus far had refused to make that change. They criticized papers like the Four Verts as chauvinistic. Chauvinistic being a somewhat Marxist word, meaning bordering on nationalism. Um, but this is the crux of this paper here. Scholars of Yiddish anarchism tend to talk about, um, this is scholars before Kenyon basically, tend to talk about uh, Yiddish anarchism uh, as perpetually in this internationalist mode, in part because its most famous members, like Emma Goldman and Alex Berkman, never swayed away from it. Um, Emma Goldman refused to identify as a Jew, basically, ever. She would, but she would um, use many other identities. She often identified as German, Russian, um, uh, American, international. The only time she really regularly identified as Jewish is when she was being arrested because she would pretend to be an old Jewish woman. Um, <laughs> But if we parse the Yiddish anarchist movement into smaller pieces and focused on its main forum, the Freya Abrishtime, which I would say is the closest thing to mainstream Yiddish anarchism, we'd see that shortly after Kishinev, this internationalist line started to be questioned and fought over. 
The real turning point was the 1905 Russian Revolution, the first real socialist revolution and a major failure, which are hundreds of horrific pogroms um, break out across the Pale of Settlement. That is the areas where Jews basically lived in Russia. That immense anti-Semitic violence was a watershed moment for the Yiddish anarchists, convincing many that the problems facing the Jewish working class were in fact unique, and that only a radicalism that could articulate itself as a specifically Jewish radicalism could hope to save it. Um, so the Kishinev program happens in 1903. Shortly afterwards, Russia enters um, the Russo-Japanese War in 1904, which is a, a miserable decision. It uh, loses horribly to Japan, which has rapidly modernized uh, in a very small amount of time. And it throws Russia into enormous economic um, poverty and basically moves all of the troops to the wrong side of the country. They were all in the Far East, or most of them anyways, and then the West started to break out. There were workers' revolts. And then at a workers' protest in St. Petersburg, the police fired on the protesters, killing something like 130 protesters, uh, sparking what we now call the Revolution of 1905, which is, uh, in most respects, the first socialist revolution in the world, though it fails. Um, this was an incredibly important revolution uh, for Jews and for socialists because often, for instance, in America, many Jews, regardless of their politics, supported socialist causes in Russia because they considered this the only option to save the Jews. Uh, there. But, and by this point, um, the mainstream of the U.S. had also sided against the Tsar as a sort of classical mm, uh, uh, despotic empire. Yiddish anarchists were exuberant when the revolution began, but didn't consider it particularly relevant to the situation of Russian Jews at first. The overall feeling was that the success, the success of the revolution was inevitable, that the end of Tsardom was near, and that this would be a victory for all oppressed peoples in Russia. But as winter turned to spring, stories of horrific violence against Russian Jews seeped into, into the pages of the Fash. In one particularly panicked article published in mid-March entitled Nikolai Mashuga, the writer claimed that for Tsar Nicholas, only one method remains to keep his power, to again provoke the oppressed elements of the people to make pogroms against the Jews. It is certain they will suffer much. In an almost pleading tone, the writer concluded, the revolution grows, it must grow, until it reaches its final goal, until Russia is liberated of its plague, the plague called Tsardism. Tsarism. The anarchist faith in the revolution was beginning to quiver in face of the growing anti-Jewish violence, which they had previously dismissed. Less than two months after the article, the Jutimir program broke out. It was the first large uh, offense against the Jews by the Black Hundreds, an infamous right-wing group, and the first program where Jews resisted with violence. 29 Jews were murdered, and according to some observers, more Christians died than Jews. It was one of the bloodiest programs yet. Jews, it seems, were learning to fight like they lived between two tigers, as Yanovsky had told them, but it was only making things worse. By the time of the Zhitomir program, the Yiddish anarchist perspective on the situation of Russian Jews had begun to reverse itself. Anti-Jewish violence was no longer an unremarkable facet of class struggle in Russia. Rather, the programs made the revolution about anti-Jewish violence and about stopping it. One Fash article proudly stated that the revolutionary spirit is stronger because of the Tsar's fortresses, prisons, and Cossack whips that perform his wonderful work. And the best thing for us, born of Jews, is the news that the Jewish workers play there such a mighty role in the struggle as leaders because of the terrible Kishinev program. This is the greatest sign for us. The Jewish workers make up the greatest portion of the revolutionaries, that they are the leading spirit of the revolutionary uprising. Such statements were a rejection of the internationalist attitude of earlier years. Now all criticism of Jewish chauvinism was gone, replaced by unabashed pride for the revolutionary character, supposed revolutionary character of Russia's Jews. The Kishinev program was no longer presented as a minor sensationalized strategy, but as a terrible bloodbath that marked the beginning of a genuine radical Jewish uprising. In the view of the fascist writers, Jews were no longer but one player in the revolution. Now the revolution was for the Jews, and the Jews had to be entirely for the revolution. By October, there had been 50-some pogroms since the beginning of the revolution in January. Just as the terror of the revolution seemed at its worst, hope came in the October Manifesto by the Tsar, which promised sweeping reforms, but shortly after, it was followed by sweeping pogroms. Between October 1905 and September 1906, there were approximately 650 pogroms in Russia, killing an estimated 3,000 Jews. The last major pogrom took place in the beginning of June in Bialystok. The violence there turned into a full battle, with Jewish self-decrims retaliating against the pogromists, leaving hundreds dead. The revolution continued on into 1917, but for most Jews, at least in America, um, the revolution had lost all hope. The sheer weight of the pogroms had ended it. The Fash aptly called this period the Storm Zeiten, the time of storms. In a lengthy article published a few days after the release of the October Manifesto, the Fash made its position clear that only an end to the anti-Jewish violence would be a successful end to the revolution. Take the Cossacks out of the street, for freedom is given by Cossacks as a mournful joke, and the fight for freedom will only continue. For here Nikolai has taken to, uh, to this old method, to drown the revolution in a sea of Jewish blood. Jewish women and children are cut into pieces. The Kishinev massacre is child's play compared to these current pogroms that the bestial Russian government provokes against the Jews. Freedom with the Nikolai, with the Trepov, with Cossacks, with whips, this is impossible. 
The incredible burden of anti-Jewish violence made the Tsar's manifesto an inadequate end to the revolution of the anarchists. The revolution's success for the fascists now only meant ensuring the safety of the Jews. The other goals of the revolution had been cast aside. It was a stance that could not have been taken only a few years earlier. The hardline internationalism that the paper had so emblemized was broken. The revolution of 1905 fizzled out. Many of its revolutionaries, fearing police retaliation, flee to the US and to other countries, starting a wave of Jewish nationalism and many new Jewish nationalist socialist movements, um, socialist nationalist movements um, that form in other countries and also in some places in Russia. Uh, I see this as the beginning of a new phase of Yiddish anarchist politics in which many abandoned the staunch internationalism of earlier years in favor of an explicitly Jewish anarchism and a radical Jewish form of politics. It was also when much of the Yiddish anarchist movement began to retreat from 